So we've had, heard a lot of reference to mechanical support uh, today. I'm going to try and see if I can succinctly uh, help you create a vision of, of where it's going and perhaps what the impediments are and what needs to be crystallized in, in, in the generation of evidence. So there are two major potential uh, areas for expansion. This is uh, straightforward. One is triaging higher risk patients off transplant lists toward mechanical support. And the second is developing rational evidence-based algorithms for treating patients before they approach the end stages of heart failure to VAD therapy, uh, actually before they're suitable for transplantation. So the real question is, how are we going to begin making these decisions? How is the patient going to, going to be fully armed with the information to help uh, he or she make this determination in their own life? So we're putting it in another way. We're looking at ways for large databases like Intermax and others to accelerate the rate of evolution from transplant ineligible patients receiving VADs to VADs as a transplant alternative. Clearly, this is in the context of a, of a platform which now is embracing smaller and smaller pumps uh, through smaller, less invasive approaches, which is really critically important to the mindset of patients receiving these therapies who are not actually uh, in the throes of dying from heart failure. So critical issues uh, for this paradigm shift are one, what is the appropriate bar for survival? How good does the survival need to be? And second is the whole issue of quality of life. Is the patient happy with uh, his existence on uh, mechanical support? And if not, why not? So let's just begin the conversation by looking at some transplant data and where we might start. So this is data from the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation, standard uh, parametric uh, survival curves for various time points. And, and the, the point is that at least a reasonable uh, starting point would be that mechanical support has to reach a two-year survival that exceeds 80% for it in general on the average to be competitive. So that's what we're looking for. Are there any uh, subsets that could generate a conversation by real life survival which exceeds 80% at two years? We also know that in real life, there are many comorbidities with heart transplantation that generate worse survivals. And this is data from another multi-center database called the Cardiac Transplant Research Database. The details aren't important, but note that with various increasing comorbidities, we know that the survival worsens. But even in this data set, which was really more than a decade old, it takes a lot to get down to an expected survival of less than 80% in two years. So we're really looking at, at, as we pass two, three, four, five, the effect of these comorbidities on survival generating worse survival, and that we must be competitive with mechanical support. So there's a lot of information that needs to be generated. So here's some real life data. This is from uh, Intermax, and this is a multivariable analysis on continuous flow pumps uh, destination therapy, in which a number of risk factors were identified. Went through a number of these with you yesterday. So this is uh, data through December of 2012, in which uh, we are looking again at destination therapy that is intended for the rest of the patient's life. And through this analysis, uh, we identified uh, a group of patients who were lower risk. That is, had few of the risk factors, did not have private, uh, previous cardiac surgery, and so on. And and this uh, really constituted 20%, seems small, but it's not insignificant, of the overall database among those patients who are not rapidly deteriorating. That is, who might be uh, considered electively for permanent destination therapy. And in fact, <clears throat> this 20% uh, of this group didn't achieve an 80% two-year survival. So this is actually the first time that I know of that any multi-institutional data has ever showed of mechanical support that you can actually uh, achieve an uh, important subset, identifiable subset, with two-year survivals of 80%. So 
So now I think the door is open for this conversation, and I think others have felt the same. But survival is not enough because clearly we need to look at quality of life as well. And quality of life to many of us in the field has always been a vague, poorly defined, uh, undisciplined aspect of, uh, of outcomes research. There are a lot of funny terms that most physicians don't realize, don't understand very well, a lot of metrics that, are, that are seem uh, not very disciplined. But, but there's no question that it's going to have a profound effect on, on conversations with patients about therapeutic choices. And what's equally important is that the real life is you don't have to have, a, have a, some poorly defined or understood quality of life metric when your pump is thrombosing, when you're having a stroke, or when you're having a recurrent GI bleed. That's a very important indicator of bad quality of life. So one, that's, uh, these are some of the things that pumps are going to have to overcome. So specifically, <clears throat> Early mortality, of course, stroke, major problem with pumps, infection of the driveline and pump pockets, right ventricular failure, pump dysfunction and thrombosis, renal dysfunction. So we're going to look at each of these now to give you some background about what the current state is as we go forward and think about applying these pumps to less sick patients or taking patients off the transplant list. So neurologic dysfunction. So Intermax has some very detailed definitions of neurologic dysfunction, specifically looking at TIAs versus <clears throat> thromboembolic strokes versus hemorrhagic strokes. Okay, what's the current status? So we know now that if you look at data over the last five years, that, that the actuarial freedom from an important stroke is 89% at one year. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, continuous flow pumps are associated with a real risk of stroke, often hemorrhagic. So <clears throat> this will be a major modifier of quality of life, of course, particularly if the stroke is permanent. So this is important to remember, about a 10% incidence uh, overall within the first year. What about infection? So infection is very rare. Within the, within the pump itself or the pump pocket, the major Achilles heel is in the driveline. So that's why these percutaneous, uh, these transcutaneous energy transfer systems are so particularly enticing. So if we look at here, the freedom from the first driveline infection uh, at uh, 12 months and specifically out to about two years, a third of the patients have experienced a major driveline infection, which often are chronic and recurring. <clears throat> there seems to be no relationship between these uh, driveline infections and how sick the patient was at implant. So uh, that's not particularly helpful. <clears throat> Everybody seems to be particularly prone to these driveline infections, particularly if you get mobility at the driveline uh, exit site. <clears throat> what about right heart failure? Well, this is a terrible problem with patients with uh, indwelling pumps. And uh, initially, the conversations were just the severest form. That is, were you bad enough to require a, a right ventricular assist device? But we've tried to refine this a little bit by looking at mild and moderate levels of right ventricular failure. There was a lot of controversy in the United States about the details of these definitions, but we've evolved some definitions with Intermax that at least allow us to look at this from many institutions. But here's the information as it stands now. So if you need to write an RVAD, if you will, at any time uh, post-implant, mostly it's within the first 24 hours, uh, but occasionally after that. But you have about a 4% freedom from requiring an RVAD with these continuous flow pumps. And it's worse if you're sicker. So in other words, if you are uh, advanced class 4 dying in cardiogenic shock, and you go to the operating room with the intent of just putting in an LVAD, you have about a 10% chance of actually coming out with an RVAD because of profound right ventricular failure. So that's an unsolved problem. What about uh, pump exchanges due to pump malfunctions? <clears throat> well, we know that for one thing, things are a lot better than they were with the old XVE. Uh, this is uh, showing pulsatile pumps. Uh, over time, freedom from device exchange due to device uh, malfunction. 
here's looking at continuous flow pumps. So it's very good. And specifically, with the continuous flow pumps uh, entered into Intermax, there was a 94% freedom from uh, device replacement or device <laughs> failure out to two years, uh, compared to essentially a 50% incidence with previous pulse stop pumps. So we've made major progress, but there's a low ongoing risk of having your device fail and requiring replacement. Now, an area of, of really major concern currently over the past year in particular uh, relates to pump thrombosis, and that is not the kind of thrombosis that causes embolic strokes, but which, which causes pump stoppage. And <clears throat> this was actually the source of information uh, from several institutions which put the Revive It trial in jeopardy. And so there, was, there, there are ongoing conversations and, and analysis which we are doing within Intermax right now to look at the, the changing likelihood of pump thrombosis uh, over time, uh, that is by year of implant, to see if equipoise, if you will, is being violated with a Revive It trial. So that, that work is ongoing. But the importance for this discussion is that there's about a 96% freedom from uh, serious pump thrombosis by 12 months. <clears throat> now in the same conversation, hemolysis is playing a bigger role because there's uh, increasing evidence that increasing, all, although all of these pumps hemolyze, when you have increasing or sudden onset of important hemolysis, that this may well be a precursor to pump thrombosis. And so there is great interest in looking at various levels and definitions for hemolysis, minor, major, and so on, that might allow us to track patients, analyze data, and potentially uh, seek out early fibrin deposition, particularly uh, near the inflow bearings of the continuous flow pumps, which could with certain interventions prevent the development of later pump thrombosis. So all of this is fine, but what about the overall burden? Because it's not like each patient just has one adverse event. They're prone to multiple adverse events. And so there's a term that's being increasingly used called the adverse event burden to the patient to help define uh, how this may impact his quality of life. So we're very immature now in our ability to think about adverse event uh, definitions, how to, how to quantify it and so on, but just as a first pass, you can see that it's a non-trivial problem. This is the freedom from any of these major adverse events or death, and you can see that with continuous flow pumps, if you look at freedom from any of them, you're only talking about a 30% freedom from any of them out to 12 months and progressively less thereafter. <clears throat> it doesn't seem to be particularly related to age, so stratified by age doesn't seem to be, make much impact. If you look at uh, severity of uh, heart failure before the pump went in, there's a dichotomy there. With the exception of right ventricular failure, uh, other adverse events, freedom from, uh, seem to be quite similar uh, there is a significant difference, but actually the magnitude of the difference is quite small, and so that even the intermax level doesn't have a profound effect on these adverse events. And if you look at it in a slightly different way, that is readmissions to the hospital, uh, we can see that intermax level uh, overall p-value 0.5 is not having an impact on the likely or freedom from your initial rehospitalization after a discharge with a van. Quality of life. So it's pretty good. Not perfect, but pretty good. If you look at the dark blue, this is, line is pre-implant. There's a dramatic, highly significant reduction in patients having extreme problems. But as you might imagine from the previous conversation about these adverse events, there is a highly significant reduction in, quote unquote, some problems. But note that 25% of the patients at 12 months are still complaining of some problems, so far from perfect. <clears throat> Likewise, and if we're looking at usual activities, same thing, mark, re mark reduction in serious problems, extreme problems, but nearly half of the patients have some problems with their usual activities uh, related to their experience with the pump. And <clears throat> finally, if we look at the 
a visual analog, that is what's called the thermometer in the quality of life uh, language, uh, we can see that there is a highly significant improvement, which is sustained out to uh, a year or more. Uh, but again, we know that patients aren't completely satisfied. So as we look forward, what are our opportunities for helping solve these problems? Well, we have a lot of new databases, which we think will provide very important comparative information. There's Metamax, which as I've mentioned to you before, has medical information uh, in those intermediate areas of, of class four. IMAX, the international database, PDMAX, all of these have just been initiated in the last year. Uh, building on this platform of Intermax, which is appro approaching 10,000 patients. And if I was uh, dreaming of information that I might come back and show you in three or four years that, that would be based on real patients rather than imagination, which is the case here, we might have enough information so that we could generate equations that we could quantify for uh, patient sets, uh, the comparison of survival with medical therapy uh, versus bad therapy for the identical patient subsets. And so we could calculate, of course, a, a survival benefit. But that wouldn't be enough because, uh, well, in addition, uh, we can also you know, generate nomograms from multivariable equations and look either over time or related to things like age, uh, the incremental uh, likelihood of death by a year or multiple years with, say, medical therapy versus device therapy. But we also may have curves that look like this. And this probably is what would happen in many situations now for individual patients when you solve their equations. That you'd see a survival benefit with a, a VAD compared to the medical treatment. But then if we were able to quantify in an equation this adverse event burden, showing the dotted lines here for the medical was dropped due to this level, but the combination of the VAD adverse event burden plus survival may drop you to this curve, make it, making it inferior in the patient's mind to device to medical treatment, and therefore he might say no thanks to a device. Hopefully, instead, I can come back and show you these curves, in which we've reduced the adverse events from the uh, devices and able to quantify it, and we show that the reduction in survival, so it, uh, including the adverse event burden, may with a device be superior to that which the patient sees with medical therapy, and therefore, the lesser sick patients, it becomes more attractive. All this is going to require more patients, uh, more analyses, and, and uh, thoughtful inferences. So in summary, uh, just a few points of some of the things that I've been saying over today and yesterday. We believe the large rigorous databases like Intermax have the best available data to examine risk factors for survival. Uh, Intermax level one, we know, are at greater risk, but if you get them through the initial period, the survival is similar to others. Patients over 65, more or less, that is elderly patients, are clearly at a higher risk if they're sicker going into the implant and very much true is severe renal or right ventricular dysfunction requiring either dialysis or an RVAD is a very uh, bad prognostic sign. Uh, is there another way to advance this last slide? Ah, thank you very much. And finally, in this last slide, among destination patients, we really do have, uh, in real life, nearly 20% of more stable patients, which uh, have a survival of 80% or more. Quality of life indicators uh, suggest sustained improvement currently out to a year or more. But very importantly, measures of overall burden of adverse events will shape the comparison of this therapy and so as this paradigm shifts with the clinical reality of small continuous flow pumps and destination therapy, the ability to limit serious adverse events is going to be the critical factor to long-term application of uh, device therapy. Thank you very much.